record. Okay, it looks like we're recording now. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us for Shorts 2. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the program. Um, and we're delighted to have with us uh, all of the filmmakers uh, in, sh in Shorts 2, Stories of the Street here with us to do a Q&A. Welcome, everybody. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. So um, I'd like to start off with um, asking each of you what the genesis of your project was. How did it come to you and why did you choose it? So um, let's start with you, Francisco. Okay, so uh, we didn't have plans uh, to make this film at all. When we started uh, 2020, uh, we actually were gonna be filming in Malawi uh, for a project that we had already, uh, a story that we had already selected, but uh, then COVID came. And uh, so we didn't want to stop working. And uh, so, so we, we decided to go ahead and find a story that we could do remotely. So, so we, we looked at the, the Bay Area and we found uh, an organization to work with. Uh, and uh, so we, we uh, agreed with them and, and started uh, the project more or less uh, mid-April, and we released the film in September. So, so that was the, the, the way that this came about. Uh -huh. And uh, just a, a personal aside, I live in, um, in, in Oakland, and I'm very close to, um, to the coffee shop, and I've, I've gone in there several times. So um, it was really great to, uh, to see your film and, and get there, that organization, um, uh, out there because they do such good work. So thank you again for making it. Mm -hmm. um, so then let's move on to um, the film Children on the Moon. Um, uh, Timon and Will, uh, can you tell us how did your project um, begin? Did you, um, did you know uh, your subjects personally? How did you find this story? Kind of what got it all started? Uh, so maybe I can, I can start and then Timon yeah. can... Uh can pick it up. Uh, the, the genesis of this project uh, was about eight or nine years ago. Um, and really the first time Tim and I ever spent more than an hour together uh, was, was on the first version of this film. Um, we sort of drove uh, down the East Coast of the US uh, talking to these people that he grew up with. Um, and this, it was going to be more of a, more of an observational style film. Uh, and then, you know, seven, seven, eight, nine years passed uh, and both of us went on to do different things. Um, but then I uh, went back to school. I went to grad school uh, with the intention of this film uh, being my thesis. So then I called him. I think the summer the before I went back to school, and I'm not sure if he really believed that uh, that it was going to happen. And then I called him a year later, and uh, the wheels started turning. And you know, a couple of years after that, here we are with uh, with a film that I think both of us really love. Yeah, uh, what he said. But to to add on to it, um, it's. Uh, it, it took some time to like really settle on this being something that we felt comfortable going forward with because when we when we started it you know eight or nine years ago um that the, the the cult hadn't really like evaporated properly yet like it was it still had some uh some more control over the people that were in it and so it actually was slightly easier to make it this time because everyone has kind of moved on with their lives, you know? Uh, but yeah, that's, I think that's uh, just adding on to what we were saying. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm curious, um, I have some follow-up questions for you, but I'll address that to everybody. Um, so uh, John, uh, your film, Ricky, how did you find your subject and uh, what was it about him that you knew would make for a good story? Yeah, so uh, I was actually at a wedding and saw someone I went to college with who does sort of 
uh, power lifting and he was lifting with Ricky at the time. And I'm sure most of y'all here have had the experience where somebody was like, that you know is like, oh, have you ever thought about making a film about this? And you're like, oh yeah, okay, like sure. <laughs> Completely <laughs> not and say, but you never really, it never turns into anything. But this actually did, like I, 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 he had sent me this interview that he had did with him for a class and I listened to it and Ricky ended up being a really fascinating person um, that I wanted to hear more about. And I meet, met him and from the moment that I met him, he was like just completely open and honest with it about like everything with me. And it was just like very obvious that uh, um, it, a film could be made with him. Nice. Uh, okay, Whitney, uh, your film Pigeon Girl, how did you find your subject and um, and how did you decide to, to make this into a film? Yeah, great. <clears throat> um, so I actually was in the middle of a production for my first film uh, in grad school about the fires in California. And when I was kind of trying to find stories, I was trying to go on GoFundMe and see who had lost their homes and who um, you know, was looking for funds during the fires. And in that search, I happened to see this beautiful girl with this bird. And I didn't really know, like it just caught my eye and I didn't really know who she was, but I kind of saved that story. And um, about a year later, I thought of her again and I was like, who was that girl? And then I read the story and she basically, you know, found this bird that flew into her window was a rescue, like was a dove that had been released for a wedding and had been like marked with Sharpies and kind of destroyed from the streets and just happened to flew into her window. And then from there, she developed this relationship with this bird and it had like eight safety pins, just wasn't a good story, but she ended up getting the money to save this bird. And I just thought, wow, this young girl rescuing this bird and what's up with the doves. And then it just kind of, as I got to know her more, um, this bird was like her best friend because she gets teased and bullied a lot in school for who she is. And in her journey, she decided to go rescue pigeons doing that there was such a, um, a need for her help for these birds in the cities. So basically I kind of um, fell in love with her vision of like healing other birds when she was traumatized by her own school. And so then it just became this visual symphony of her rescuing the birds her kind of being adventurous and being wild and just kind of unfolded to this, you know, hero's story for this young 10 year old girl. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, Mike, um, Stoop Symphony, how did you find your subject? So uh, I live in San Francisco and um, I mean, this, the subject uh, Saul is a cello player who's been um, doing these uh, quarantine symphonies uh, from his, from, from the front porch of his home. And uh, he's become something of a local legend. And so my girlfriend actually came home one day and she's like, there's this magical thing happening near Golden Gate Park. I heard this music, it's amazing. Um, and at the time there really weren't many gatherings happening obviously because of COVID. Um, and so we were just curious to check it out. And um, when I did a little bit of research about him like I just kind of did a little search online I found that he actually had kind of gone viral already um, at like through the lens of being an unemployed musician uh, but he wasn't given that much like he wasn't paid that much respect and I, I felt that there could be a really like more compelling like cinematic approach to telling his story um, and when we spoke he was just super open to um, like letting me into his world and telling me the the challenges that he's faced as a um, as a musician dealing with um, not being able to perform in symphonies in the Bay Area um, and it just kind of developed super quickly after that. Thank you. Yeah. So something that I'm always um, really fascinated by with documentary filmmaking is this relationship between director and subject or subjects. It's such a sacred kind of special relationship, unlike narrative film with directors and actors, um, because you are showing these people for who they are. Um, so that being said, I'm really curious what all of your, your directing styles and what your relationships with your subjects are and how, how you gain their trust um, you know, to tell their stories. 
So, uh, so let's start in the reverse order uh, and work our way back. Um, so Mike, with, with your film, um, can, you, can you let us know about kind of your, your approach to, to gaining your subject's trust? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, as I got to know Saul, I think that one of the things that made it a little bit easier is that I've kind of um, worked on a, a number of um, similar documentary stories. Uh, so, you know, I could kind of point to him and say, hey, there's, you know, this is the kind of thing that I'm interested in doing for you and for your story. Um, would you be open to it? Um, and I mean, he, he loved the stuff I'd done, thankfully. And so it kind of just kicked off from there. Um, but we, you know, we sat down, I, I only um, interviewed him one time. This is just, you know, it's a, it's a short film that we made together. Uh, and I actually had to go inside his house um, during, you know, like a, a pretty frightening time um, wearing a mask and having to like deal with all sorts of really uncomfortable things beyond just like having him open up about his story and his world. And um, I don't know, I think we bonded through those like additional challenges and um, maybe kind of fast tracked our relationship. And he, he was just like from, from the first moment we started working together, really open and just willing to say, oh, you know, do you need that? Do you need me to do this? Do you need me to do that? And um, not to mention just being like pretty, uh, yeah, willing to like say the honest truth, um, which is really helpful too, and and be vulnerable on on camera and um, in in the conversations that we had. And has he seen the film? And what were his in, impressions? Oh, he he was super excited about it. I think um, there wasn't any kind of like documentation of the the work that he'd been doing, and I think that he had put all this investment into bringing together his neighborhood and his community. And it was kind of a nice summation. Like every week he goes out and he does these um, porch shows. And the benefit is really just seeing all these people that um, get joy from it and then being able to chat with them afterwards. But now he has this tangible piece of um, kind of evidence of this like time in his life. Um, and just like a, a pretty uh, compact uh, like storytelling vessel, like it kind of, in a sense, explains like the 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 challenges that musicians are facing, uh, but also like the 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 lack of human connection um, and his his like creative willingness to like overcome and and to find um, a way to make it work, you know, um, even if it wasn't like in an ideal sense, because um, he obviously still um, misses playing for the symphonies. Sure. Okay, uh, Whitney, um, tell us a little bit about your approach with your subject. Yeah, <clears throat> so my subject, she, she is 10 years old, and I think any story with a child as intimately and as personal as this one um, was able to, I was able to produce, um, comes with just a great deal of responsibility. So being very mindful of that, um, I worked very closely with the mother, and we had, even before filming, just a long conversation um, and just being really vulnerable and honest with her. And in a lot of ways, she, she you know, gave me the insight that she, Maryam was just a different kind of child. Like she's very um, expressive and very passionate and very emotional. And um, that's part of who she is. And so the mother really um, was like, I, I'm open to you filming that side of her. Um, and I think once I got that rite of passage, I was very delicate and kind of responsible for making sure that I took all of Maryam with grace and highlighted her passion and highlighted her like her frustration and highlighted her her character as like this hero. And so, but the mother really allowed me to do that. I don't think without that, I wouldn't have been able to make this film the way I, I could have showed all the layers of a, of a, ch a child. Um, and then I think, once I had that rite of passage, I just really explored Maryam for who she is and, and just let her be the person in front of the camera and, you know, just let her guide the visuals and guide the journey and, you know, allowing that to unfold. I think it progressed more and more that she became more comfortable, more open with us. Um, and I think in the end, I, in the editing process too, it was a lot of decisions. And I spoke with a lot of mothers, a lot of women, and kind of tried to find the balance of 
how to be, um, you know, almost like a parent in the editing. Like you want to protect her, but you also want her to be honest and vulnerable. So the editing process was as equally as important as the relationship um, with her. Sure. Um, so then, um, and then Mary M eventually, I think she, I brought her to a lot of screenings and I bought her a lot of shows. And I think for the first time, like since she got bullied a lot for what she did with the pigeons in school, I think the people in the audience and the crowds were very excited about what she did. And so it kind of gave her a little recognition that what she was doing is actually cool or um, at least supportive. And I think that gave her a little bit more, I hope it gave her more confidence. Um, yeah, that's great. Oh. Thank you. Okay, John, um, same question to you about your, um, your approach to working with your subject. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, Ricky is, was actually like very open from the start. So there wasn't a whole lot of convincing that needed to be done. And I think sometimes it can work like that, where it's like, it can be a little bit of a self-selecting process, um, where the, the characters of your film sort of, it's, it's, it, it becomes easier if they, uh, initially want to be a part of it. Um, you know, and, and then at the same time, uh, I, I always try and be open about what I'm doing and have discussions about, you know, what they see as like their story, um, and what parts that they want to highlight. Um, but yeah, Ricky was pretty much down to, to go along with it and trusted me from the beginning. Um, which I felt very lucky, but also like then, you know, you feel a responsibility with that as well. Um, and so I, I tried to be as fair and honest with his story as possible and, um, and really show him and sort of a, a, the fullest um, form that I could. And has he seen the film? He has seen the film. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think like a lot of times I was a little more nervous about like the vulnerabilities that he like <laughs> was telling me on camera than he was. And so I was like a little nervous to show it to him at, at, at first because I think the film can be interpreted in a lot of different ways mm -hmm. um, depending on your own experiences. Um, but he, he really liked it, so yeah. Great. So uh, Will and, uh, and Tim and, um, so Tim, and you mentioned that, that you grew up with a lot of these, the subjects in your film. So you knew them personally. Um, I'm curious what, um, how that affected your approach um, to having them, you know, photograph for your film. Um, and also um, for you, Will, if you did not know the subjects, uh, how was it for you working with them? Um, I can start this one off, Will. Uh, so yeah, this was a, uh, a, a bit of an unusual project, I think, to approach, you know, in a traditional sense, because um, I, I was also born and raised into the cult that we were interviewing all those subjects from. They're old friends of mine from from childhood. So that was the kind of thing where I think uh, if I'm not sure what the process would have been approaching them if I hadn't had that common ground. Um, but this this was you know, uh, a film that Will and I started making together dec like almost a decade ago. Um, and the landscape of the landscape of that church and the landscape of the life, the day-to-day -day lives of everyone that we had been talking with before had just changed so much over the last eight or nine years, not just like in an internal politics kind of way of like, you know, when you're one year out of leaving a cult, it's very different from 10 years, you know? Um, so we kind of just had like a casual sense of access back then because everybody was like, sure, I'll talk about it. I don't know what's going on. Right. And then this time, you know, we're going back to talk with these people, um, and they've kind of settled into their lives. So it was actually like a slightly tougher sell even to, you know, uh, people that I had gone through this with, like, they know me, you know what I mean? But it was still like, I don't know if I want to talk about that again, but um you know i think will and i had very different experiences here because uh i think the presence of will helped secure the trust of these uh these subjects sometimes because 
they knew that there was someone who would be more impartial to everything than than I would have been. Um, so yeah, well, I'm also just curious to hear you talk about that again, like what your process was, uh, you know, co-directing this. Yeah, I mean, it, it like Tim and has been saying, it's it was it was a real. Uh, you know, I don't. I, it it certainly wouldn't have turned out uh, the same, uh, and I think to its detriment if if both Tim and and I hadn't been there, uh, working in tandem, um, because you know his direct experience with this, and for me, it is still a deeply personal film, uh, even though I did not grow up in the Unification Church. Um, I I think, I think a lot of the themes apply to like everybody of our generation who grew up in this country. Um, but yeah, I was, I was just like really uh, honored that these people would, would share their, you know, their time and, and their, their experiences with us. Um, and I think the, you know, the bond between, between director and subject in, you know, in a documentary context is such a, uh, such a, a, I don't, I hate to say sacred, but it is a sacred thing that, um, you know, and, and that's, and it's never something that I want to take for granted. And it's never something that I just want to like swoop in and, and, and like get what I need and then disappear. Um, and especially like through the editing process, um, because I, I cut the film and and just uh, you know, further developing my personal bond with these people uh, really, really deepened through the editing process. Um, and I, I think that what we came away with uh, was something, you know, greater than any, any one uh, individual involved in this process. Um, I think we, we landed on something that was maybe true for all of us. Um, just a quick follow up. I'm curious, what has the reaction been not only to um, the subjects that we see in the film, but other members of the church? Um, do they know about the film? Have they seen it? Um, what's happening there? Yeah, so uh, qu quite a few uh, former members in, in my generation have seen it, um, and uh, quite a few of our parents' generation as well. Um, it's been mostly it's been mostly positive, but uh, I, I think that's largely because so much of the church's population has just shrunk over the last ten years. I mean, people have been leaving um, in droves for various reasons, but um, you know, we'll we'll get uh, just out of nowhere messages from people that I've, I've never met or never heard of who are also part of the church in some other country. And um, that's been interesting. But um, I think other than like the positive feedback, a, a surprising amount of like regret and shame feedback from people who uh, consider themselves to be like enablers <laughs> of, you know, bad things that happened uh, in the in the church. And they'll see this movie or they'll see, you know, a couple of our friends have uh, another film on a similar subject that's like a feature that just came out and it's like causing ripples in the same communities. But that was unexpected that there would be so many people like apologizing, you know, <laughs> you, I don't know, you just don't think that will happen. Yeah, and actually I, in, in my uh, very small sample size, but I, I've received, um, maybe some of the most introspective feedback from viewers who are actively religious, not, not in the Unification Church, um, but I, I do appreciate that it, uh, and I'm, I'm not for or against any religion, um, but I, I did find it really interesting the, the uh, you know, the conversations that were produced from, from that. Yeah, I could imagine. Um... Francisco, uh, tell us about um, your approach with your subjects in your film. Yeah, let, let me start by, by saying that we only focus our, our, we only do films 
about uh, refugee self-reliance. And, and, and the reason is that we want to create uh, uh, awareness and support for this uh, very important topic that is, is huge. And there are 27 million refugees in the world and, and, and it's, uh, the number is growing. So, so you know, the, the, when we started thinking about this project and, and we heard about the project that uh, Doc Hewitt, uh, who is the, the founder of 1951 Coffee, uh, we, we actually uh, called him and, uh, and, and got in touch with him and I started talking about the, this idea of making a, a documentary about the, the, the project that he was working on. And so, so we, you know, since then we, you know, and the, 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 the good news about, uh, you know, the, this conversation is that he's also working for towards uh, refugee self-reliance in the US. And so, so by having that base, it just allows to start the conversation in a very, very solid way because we're both working, uh, my, my team and his team, uh, you know, working towards the same goal. And so we, that, that started the conversation. And believe me, uh, we, we have spent so much time uh, talking uh, through Zoom because I, I actually don't know him personally. Uh, we have made a, a film about him and, and his project, but, but we have uh, only met through, through, uh, through Zoom and, and we have spent so much time, you know, and this is, in my view, developing strong relationship is, you know, a critical part of, of doing a, a solid doc documentary. And so we do not spare any time in building those relationship. And, and he actually brought four more uh, four more people into the, the documentary. So, you know, it, it, it really got interesting because it's people from different backgrounds, different countries, uh, uh, Batu, Meg, Leve, uh, you know, they, they are very interesting people, but with completely different backgrounds. And we have to be very sensitive of, of their cultures and, and the way, you know, they, they approach things. And, and we, so we started uh, building the, the relationship with them too. And, uh, you know, fortunately by keeping them really strongly in the loop of what we were doing and, and you know, been, been mindful of the, you know, the things that, that uh, from, it could be religious, that uh, religion that, that uh, some things, uh, you know, we, we just have to be careful with. Uh, so, so they were, all the time, uh, you know, we maintain the communication very strongly, and uh, you know, they they felt comfortable that, that we were taking in account uh, those those views, and uh, so so you know, we I, I think that was a, a a very positive things that that allow us to do what we did in this short time. Thank you. So um, one thing that um, this is sort of a general question to everybody. Um, I'm curious what changed um, in your film in the editing room. Some of you, um, I think like Whitney have um, hinted at this a little bit already, but um, what was, I guess, maybe your major, your, something that really shifted the film? Like what was the big epiphany that each of you had in the editing room that, um, that changed your film. Um, so let's start with you, Francisco, and we'll work our way uh, back. Yeah, I, I, I wish uh, my, my daughter was going to be here because she is the, the editor uh, of the film. And we, were, we launched the home storytellers together. And uh, I wish she, she could tell you exactly you know, how, what went on in the editing room. But, but it became actually, uh, I, I mean, it's a short film, but, but editing this uh, and, and connecting these uh, four stories became a, a bit of a challenge and, and finding the, the right thread to be able to tell this story in 19 minutes and having four, four subjects and each one with very different backgrounds and very different stories. So, so you know, at the end, we, we found that the, the best way to tell this story was, uh, you know, having Doug Hewitt as, as, a, as an American 
who came from, from a very conservative state uh, in the US Tennessee uh, and how he transformed his views of the world through, through his young age and, 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 and a number of things that happened and how he became a, a really strong uh, advocate of the refugees in the US. And, and that was so strong that, that he decided to go ahead and creating this project that, that he, he has been running for, for a few years. So for us, you know, that was the, the key thing. How, how do we tell this story? Uh, and we believe that that was very strong and that was really actually really positive too because the main audience of this film is the US. Uh, and, and we thought that by having a US person being the, the kind of the, the spokesperson of, of, of the film was, and somebody that had translated from a very conservative to, to a person that, that you know, it has a, a lot more broader thinking during the current political situation was very strong. Thank you. Um, Will and, uh, and Timon, um, what changed the most for you um, in post? Uh, quite a bit. Uh, this, this film, uh, we really, uh, a, a lot of it was found in the edit, uh, but probably the two major things is we filmed interviews with six people and ended up using three. Uh, and also we uh, discovered the home movie element uh, in the edit process. Uh, and it, it's, it's sort of an unusual film in that it only has two visual elements, um, the interviews and the home movies. Um, but it, it, it ended up being a, I think, uh, deceptively simple edit that, that we're really happy with. Yeah, I, I think the first cut was something like an hour and 10 minutes. Is that, is that right, Will? It's, it was around that. It was, it was, uh, it was pretty long. And we got it down to what, 17 and change? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I think the, the biggest thing, um, I mean, we'll, we'll cut this, but for me as a, as a process of like engaging with cuts, the thing that became the, uh, the, the biggest thing to come to terms with, at least for me, was that it was going to become a very like, uh, storytelling kind of movie because we don't end up going with these subjects anywhere. Right. Like, I think we, we did a little bit of shooting w with actual landmarks that are, you know, currently in, in the area um, that have a lot of context for, for the subjects. And, you know, there was considering like, you know, bringing them around to these places, like we did some exterior shooting with them and just losing that element entirely was like, a, uh, that, that, that was a hurdle at first for me because I thought that it would just prevent there from being context, but um, it ended up working pretty well. Thank you. John, um, any any major changes for you with uh, with your film Ricky and the edit? Yeah, so the this the this film was kind of like produced and edited simultaneously. Uh, it happened over we were shooting over like three years, <laughs> uh, so and it was you know a side project. So we weren't shooting constantly, but like every other month or something, and go out and shoot with Ricky. Um, and, it, and it changed a lot because the initial idea was he was going to set the record for this lift and we were going to follow him and doing that and he's going to go to a competition and he's either going to do it or not. Um, but uh, pretty quickly, uh, it became apparent that that probably wasn't going to happen. And um, so it, it forced us to sort of rethink the entire structure of the film, and um, and 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 yeah, we we were sort of like finding it as we went, and that led led me down many paths. You know, I tried uh, you know filming a lot more with his wife Jennifer, trying to incorporate more with his son. Um, you know, there's like a rugby team that he films with, so there were like very a lot of different things, whole days that are not included in the film at all. Uh, 
and um, but it it became a process of distillation where um, it I it we just focused on the thing that was sort of core to his story, which um, I think was is his relationship with his father, and um, so it it became focusing more and more on that, and. Um, and so the the structure of the film just sort of like ended up revolving around that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure for everyone, there's just so much that you um, that you end up not using, which um, is another um, interesting question to ask everybody if, if we had all the time. But um, for you, Whitney, what what were some of your um, kind of epiphanies in in the edit? Yeah, I think it's a good question and. You know, I think as all filmmakers, when we go and make footage and we come back, it's like such a different exchange of information. So when I came back to the edit, um, I was like, well, what are all these scenes meaning? Like, can I point to a parent and child relationship? And that seemed to be a very clear streamline, like how there's beauty in raising a child and there's also like difficulty in raising a child. And then how can I fit that into the story? How can I fit Miriam in school in the story? How can I fit the rescuing the birds? Like everything had such, it could be their own film. And so in the end, I kind of just sat with all of the scenes, you know, in my studio laid out. And I was like, what is all the material saying universally? And I think coming to that idea kind of later in the edit, once I had the scenes together, that it's just really hard to be yourself. And if I made all of those scenes, challenging what it means to be yourself and how Maryam is constantly trying to just be herself. And so at the very end of the editing, I had this one scene with like her, um, with the birds walking up the, um, the sand dunes and just being free and being wild. And I felt like if every scene could relate to that end scene and kind of have it pay off that she just needs to be herself and be wild and be free, then that will feel so satisfying. And we all can kind of relate to the struggles of trying to be ourselves and be free. And so it was just making the message more universal that Maryam could be a metaphor. She could be a, her own character, but that she could also relate to many people who may feel that they have lost sight of who they are or want to gain sight of who they are. And so I wasn't expecting such a, an attempt at a universal message, but um, I was excited that it kind of came to me in the process and that I try to work as more poetic in the editing and storytelling in general as an artist. I try to find metaphors, I try to find symbols. And so really making that feel um, present in the edit was important to me in the very end, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I know that's exactly why I connected to the film. Um, uh, so Mike, um, let's, uh, same question for you. Um, what uh, what was your major takeaway or a change or something that happened in, in the edit that that uh, that you'd like to talk about? Ooh, that's a curveball. The major takeaway. I wasn't thinking about that. Um, but with regards to the edit, I did have one thought that kind of popped into my head. Um, this film was always going to be about this subject, um, Saul Richmond Rakard, uh, the cellist player. And as I was like cutting it, um, I had like a version that I was liking and started showing it around, um, looking for feedback, like amongst friends and other creatives. And one of the things that somebody kind of pushed back on is that they're, they're like, um, you know, he he's telling us about this like beautiful, gorgeous experience, but like, how was it from the other side? And like, what did people who were at these shows kind of feel and how did they connect to it? Um, because you have this guy who is super talented um, and he's kind of, you know, he, he was able to describe what it meant, but um, I went back into the edit and I was able to like find clips um, and moments of the audience relating to it so that he actually didn't have to say as much. Um, and visually it kind of just came together in a way that like you could understand um, what this meant um, for the audience. And so that that felt like a pretty, pretty big success. Thank you. Um, so I think we're just about out of time, but I wanted to, again, thank everybody, not only for being here, but really for, for making these films, for doing what you do, um, especially during such difficult times. Um, I don't know how many people were working during COVID times, but um, you know, let's face it, it's always hard to make a film. 
Um, so thank you again for telling these stories. And for you viewers at home, I really recommend, you know, Googling everybody's name that's here, um, seeing their other work on Vimeo, on YouTube, on their personal sites, wherever you can, um, because uh, everybody's very talented here. So thank you again so much. And uh, I hope uh, everybody can check out all the other shorts programs. There's a lot of great stuff to see. Um, thanks again, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.